This week, Clea Ostendorf from Code42 is with us to discuss why cyber hygiene requires curious talent. Then, in the enterprise security news, early stage funding is all the rage this week. AI startups continue to pop out of stealth. The buyer's market continues with more interesting acquisitions. Purpose-built large language models for security, benchmarking LLMs for security. GoFetch, more like, well, I couldn't come up with anything clever there, but uh, we'll talk about that. CrowdStrike and NVIDIA team up. Why do people trust AI? And what do Google Sheets and Carlos Sainz Jr. have in common? All that and more on this episode of Enterprise Security Weekly. This is a Security Weekly production for security professionals by security professionals. Please visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to subscribe to all the shows on our network. It's the show where we talk security vendors and aren't afraid to name names. It's Enterprise Security Weekly. Identity is at the core of every great digital experience. Ping Identity solutions support the scale, flexibility, and resiliency required by enterprise-level IT teams for lasting digital transformation. With 99.99% uptime and over 3 billion identities under management, they're the only identity vendor that's proven to champion the scale, performance, and security of large enterprises. That's why Ping Identity champions your unique identity needs. They give you the tools to offer your users users the right access at the right times, no matter how they connect with you. Visit securityweekly.com forward slash ping identity to learn more. 2024 will be the year of cryptography, driven by compliance requirements like PCI DSS 4.0 and the long-awaited NIST standardized post-quantum algorithms. No longer can enterprises take their cryptography for granted. Cypher Insights from Quantum Exchange brings clarity to cyber risk blind spots that other point and scan solutions miss. The continuous network monitoring and response tool flags, scores, and prioritizes dozens of crypto risk factors in near real time displayed through a single user-friendly dashboard for efficient management and remediation. Empower your NOC and SOC teams with actionable intelligence. Demonstrate proof of strong encryption required for zero trust. Gain the visibility and crypto inventory needed to begin your quantum safe journey. To learn more, visit securityweekly.com forward slash quantum exchange. Welcome to Enterprise Security Weekly and happy Weed Appreciation Day. This is episode 355, recorded on Thursday, March 28th, 2024. I'm your host, Adrian Sanabria, and joining me is the Admiral of AI, the Captain of Content, Katie Teitler Santulo. How are you doing, Katie? I'm pretty sure that first bullet point is inaccurate, but I am curious about Weed Appreciation Day. Which which yeah. usage of the word are we appreciating it? Like the weeds in my lawn or? Yes. Yes. The weeds in your lawn. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, okay. It's uh, yeah. It, I was definitely one of those homeowners who, who liked the clover and the dandelions and stuff like that. And I wouldn't do anything to get rid of them. Um, but uh, yes, that is the kind of weeds that we're talking about. Uh, it is okay. not April 20th. <laughs> yeah, I was like, that's the one I know. Right. Right. But also uh, in a few days is a very important day. It's World Backup Day. Uh, March 31st is World Backup Day. And in a day and age where everyone has, you know, at least a moderate sized digital footprint, uh, you know, it can be a really bad day when you lose all your data, you lose access to your Gmail or, you know, your iPhone or something like that. And it wasn't syncing with iCloud. So very important day. Unfortunately, it does not fall on a Thursday when we're doing a podcast. So uh, today is the closest day to talk about it. Uh, but also like a like a digital estate plan too. Every time I you know you know concerned about my health or anything like that, you know, it's one of my biggest fears is that uh, something happens to me and and I've got all this crap I've got access to, you know, and how do my friends and family get into it? Right? Like it's really well secured. Uh, and, and it's something I've seen happen to a lot of people where all of a sudden all the photos are gone. You know, nobody has the, uh, their loved one's fingerprint to get into it. Nobody can pay the bills. You know, it, it's, it's just a huge, huge mess that we have to think about these days. Best excuse ever for a password vault. All they yeah. need is one password. 
Right, right. That doesn't oh. cover the backup. That doesn't cover the backup. <laughs> but you said getting into all of your accounts. Are you endorsing a specific brand there or was that coincidence? No, that was just, I'm not even Italian. Yeah. I just use my hands to talk a lot. Yeah. Well, you said one I, password. I, all they need is. Oh, yeah. did I? Oh. Yeah, you okay. said all they need is one password. <laughs> no, I said one password vault. Didn't I? Okay. Right. Either company, way. The right. Yeah. I one password yeah. is a great cup. There are lots of other password vaults. I endorse them all. Use them all. Well, don't use them all. And that they would do, get complicated. They, and they, they have an emergency recovery kit that they encourage you to print out on a piece of paper and you put that in a lockbox somewhere in a bank or something like that, somewhere physically secure. And then your family can get into all that stuff. But yeah, I agree. Um, uh, password vaults can help a lot there. My my dad passed away and we had to hack into his computer. Oh. So we used the, the hint that he gave on his login, but English wasn't his first language. So the oh. hint, we didn't know if, if the hint was, you know, spelled correctly, if it was, you know, how he really wanted to interpret it. I finally got into it. It was sort of a game at that point. Um, but yeah, definitely challenging. Yeah. Well, that is yeah, an that... advantage that you have. A lot of people sure. don't. It would be so much easier just to get a password fault. And it, it, it's the yeah. last time that you need that extra stress, right? On, on top of- I know, of... It, was, it was horrible. And it yeah. was a machine I wasn't used to using. And I was like, I, how do you use Windows these days? I don't get it. Right. But yeah, I made it work. It's a fun story now. Yeah, now. <laughs> mm -hmm. Hindsight yeah. makes everything a lot more enjoyable. Oh, yeah. 100%. All right, a quick announcement here, and we'll jump into the interview. Uh, Google has announced that they will be shutting down the Google Podcast platform in mid-2024 uh, to ensure that you don't lose access to this podcast uh, and other Security Weekly content. Uh, please make sure you subscribe to your favorite podcast feeds on something else, uh, Spotify, YouTube, Music, uh, Amazon Music, Apple Podcasts, Overcast, Podcast Addict, Pocket Casts, or anywhere else you listen to podcasts. And yes, those are all real things, and, and we're on all those things. And um, yeah, there, there's a lot of alternatives. Uh, I don't think people are going to miss Google Podcasts particularly too much. Uh, visit securityweekly.com forward slash subscribe to find the buttons to subscribe to each of those shows. All right. And today we're talking about why cyber hygiene requires curious talent. We're excited to have Clea Ostendorf, field CISO with Code42 with us today. And this is probably the best bio that I've read in a while. Um, <laughs> she says there are two types of people, those who follow the instructions while cooking and those who read the ingredients and then go off and do their own thing. Uh, Clea is the latter, which has served her well as she's navigated various roles in technology and security from sales to program management, most re recently as the field CISO for Code42. And um, yeah, I, I love this bio, um, you know, th this I because I, I cook the same way, right? Like it's it's like, OK, give me give me the general vibe, the feel, the ingredients and stuff like that. And yeah, I, you know, I, I know what to do with these ingredients, uh, you know, get out of the way. <laughs> yeah, that's, that's how I feel too. But baking doesn't work that way. So I have oh. a lot of flops and baking. Yeah. Not, yeah. not in terms of, uh, you know, like, like, uh, you definitely want to measure way things like that, you know, like, and the like, order of ingredients really matter. Yeah. yeah. Maybe, maybe in terms of like toppings and like additional things that you maybe throw into the mix, but, uh, there's a little room for, for, uh, you know, putting your own personal touch on it, but yeah. I don't do it, but it does. I do a lot of baking. It absolutely, because I'm more of a baker than, I mean, I do cook, but I don't enjoy it. It absolutely matters, you know, the texture of what you're baking. If you're putting things in in a certain order, or if you over mix or over whip, or, uh, you know, a little bit more of this, it, it might yeah. not mean the difference between, oh my goodness, I can't eat this and yum but you can tell the difference between an amateur baker and somebody who understands yeah. you know when they say well, fold in the whatever or add in right. the, add your dry ingredients into the wet ingredients slowly as somebody who understands what that means it makes a big difference now i just want cake thanks so much guys yeah I mean, it could mean your popovers or plop unders right you know like <laughs> 
I, I mean, structurally, like there's a lot of things that if you screw it up a little bit, like it doesn't uh, get the final form that it's supposed to have, right? Like it just fails. But, uh, but I think it's I think it's sort of like there are really two mindsets. Like, are you more comfortable following instructions and having that order? And that's like a skill in itself. Or can you kind of do you feel more comfortable seeing what you're trying to get to and then testing the waters as you go? No, you I, know, think I think we can both sides of the brain. I think we can connect this metaphor to security, too, because I think a lot of, of it has, to, has a lot to do with experience. Right. Like like you you have to fail a bunch of times to know where you can kind of, you know, play it yourself and, and where you've got some room to, uh, uh, you know, to, to customize things, to do things uh, uh, a bit differently. And, um, and yeah, the, you know, successes and failures, you got to have a bunch under your belt. I think, it, you know, cooking is definitely that way where you're going to screw it up a lot before you figure out how, you know, the, the skills you need to make things taste great, you know, and the, like there's certain formulas that if you follow those every time, like even if you mess up the recipe, it's still going to taste great. You know, you're still going to, everybody's still going to enjoy dinner, even if it's not what the recipe intended. Yeah, agreed. Italian is my go-to. So easy to me. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Garlic, yeah. garlic onions, you know, move on. Yeah. Good olive yeah. oil. All, good, good olive oil. oil. Good oil, yeah. olive oil, not the cheap, <laughs> not the cheap. Uh, it, yeah. I mean, there. it's all about the ingredients, right? You know, like, like sure, recipes are simple, you know, but, uh, but yeah, if you skimp on the ingredients, uh, that's all the difference. Um, so, yeah, let's, uh, so let's start out defining cyber hygiene, what, what we're talking about when we, when we say uh, cyber hygiene and, uh, and, and then maybe connect that to, you know, why curious talent is, uh, is important there. Sure. So. In my, from my perspective, cyber hygiene is thinking about all of the, the basics, right? If we're going to use the cookie metaphor throughout this, let's just go all in. So yeah. the basics, right? Like how are you um, setting up your passwords, right? We talked about passwords earlier. You know, do you have strong passwords? Are you thinking about access? You know, all the basic things that go into a strong cybersecurity program or just, you know, pre protecting yourself and your organization. And then continually keeping those things updated, right? Like don't just have one password that's banana and then you rotate a few times and teaching that, you know, throughout, throughout the life cycle. I've been on recently a lot of panels, you know, talking about cloud security. We talk about all these tools that we're, that we're purchasing and that we're deploying and it gets back to, well, are you using, you know, a, a generic password? Are you right. ensuring that, you know, your access is correct? Are you shutting down S3 buckets when you don't need them? You know, it's just like the, the basic things that aren't the exciting parts of security, but we have to do it. And then no one wants to do it. So how do you motivate people to get involved with that? And I think bringing in curious talent, and I would say people who maybe are not in your traditional path within security, who have come up and who understand, you know, the macro threats and have worked in them, but those who understand how to work with people and get them to think securely in the way that you're trying to get through. That's yeah, not connected. In trying to continue with this uh, metaphor, yeah, I'm thinking about all the, all the ways things in the kitchen go wrong. Like if you try and shortcut something or, or, you know, you're, you're missing an ingredient cause you didn't prepare correctly, you know, and you try and make a substitution, you're not sure if it's going to work. Um, yeah. Trying to speed things up. Like there's certain things in, in cooking, you know, sorry. Like you're just gonna have to wait, you know. It's, it's caramelized uh, onions and don't use uh, um, that canned garlic. To me, that's ooh. like you're gonna kill, right? Yeah. You're just gonna kill the flavor. So it's the same thing. Like if you're trying to just plop a single shortcut in, it's not gonna work. And similarly, yeah, and, and if just, you have um, dull knives, just like in security, if your skills are dull, if you haven't used them in the while, if they're not you know, in top form, are you going to be prepared to tackle the fundamental things that yeah. lead to the breaches? Because it's never the cool, sexy stuff that we all want to take little online courses or in-person workshops on. Yeah. Well, like one thing I learned is, uh, you know, is it, baking powder, you know, can get old and it just doesn't work very well. 
you know, after you've had it for a while. So if you haven't, I don't bake that often. So that's one of the key things I got to check is like, how old is this baking powder? And similarly, I do a lot of postmortem research on, on breaches and, uh, and, and study failures. And that's, that's a common thing that I find is that uh, people will set things up, forget about them, forget to maintain them. And then they're not doing their job anymore. You know, uh, why didn't we detect this attack? Oh, because the license expired or, you know, we didn't rotate some certificates or, you know, some common maintenance item that's just part of your hygiene uh, wasn't taking place because it was off, you know, uh, you know, somebody wasn't thinking about it. Somebody didn't plan for it. Uh, that process, uh, you know, that maintenance just didn't happen. Yeah. False. It falls through the cracks because no one wants to own that because that's boring. I mean, it is boring. It's not the it's not the exciting part of security, which is you know, what you're alluding to, like, how are we preventing attacks? And what does it look like? Let's play with the new tech. It's not, it's not the fun yeah. stuff. It seems like stuff we can automate anyway. Like, like I think stuff like we that, should be. you know, like, like, uh, you know, are you going to automate renewal for that? You know, in turn, you know, with the, with a license, uh, you know, with certificates, certainly after let's encrypt, uh, became a thing. If you need like internal certificates for things, you know, I saw a lot of people automating those processes you know, that, that no longer became a, you know, was no longer a manual thing, especially since those Let's Encrypt certs, uh, you know, I think like the maximum length was three months or six months or something like that anyway. So uh, you really didn't want to have to do that all the time with dozens of websites. So uh, I think there's a lot more automation we could do in a lot of these things that would make cyber hygiene a lot easier and kind of interested to see if AI helps us with some of that as well. Um, yeah. Seems like automation well, helping is... everywhere else. So yeah, why not yeah. throw it here too? Yeah. So uh, well, let's try and combine this with the the curious talent side. So I don't I don't know if you saw the show notes, but you know I kind of uh, I was kind of kind of reminiscing a, a bit to when I worked on the the enterprise side, and uh, you know just coming up through my career, it, I, I, some of the most interesting things I learned had nothing to do with cybersecurity and didn't come from people who had learned them in cybersecurity, a lot of them just came from uh, from outside. And we tend to think of cybersecurity as this kind of unique, you know, special thing. And we've got to do everything from scratch and everything is, you know, nobody can help us with this. And that's why it's really hard. And, you know, the more and more I look at uh, how other people do things after I've been in this ind industry for 20 years, I'm like, yeah, it's the same problem. You know, why aren't we just doing that? Why aren't we just doing those things? Yeah, um, I, I completely agree. I mean, I got into cyber because I thought it was this this magic superpower that people had. And I, I don't want to discredit it because I, I still think there's a lot of incredible talent that really straddles that that good and evil. I mean, if you had the ability to look at, you know, say somebody's bank account, just because you're curious, you don't want to do anything bad with it, but you just want to look. That's pretty cool. Now, that's not how most people are using their skills, right? Um, but I think we need to look beyond the, the standard skill sets, right? Um, and we are finding that you can't just tool away these problems. There is such a human element within cybersecurity to not only have people do the basic hygiene, like patch your machine. I got six pings this week and they're like, I don't want to do this, but I know that Apple has an OS update that if you don't do that, you are vulnerable to a very specific attack and let's, you know, let's patch that. But it's that connecting that dot that, you know, your average user is going to say, this is annoying to me. Let's cancel this out. Whereas if you have somebody explaining why you need to do this, how it could affect you directly, not just the company, let's, how, how's this going to affect you? It's a different conversation. And um, I, I don't think we need to, I don't think we need to, should expect everyone to be able to do the the red teaming and and the hardcore hacking side of security, and also be able to win the hearts and minds of the people your your users, right? There's two there's two different skill sets, and I think we need to start embracing. And many organizations are embracing bridging that um, and having different teams helping communicate. Maybe having an actual communication person within the security team, or hiring people to help get the word out. Right. And I'm seeing that more in hiring different types of talent. Yeah. And uh, Andy Ellis was doing some interviews, um, you know, some podcasts maybe a couple of years ago. And, and uh, his, his approach to, you know, addressing his uh, hiring challenges uh, when he was at Akamai 
and I, I think he had built a team of 90 or so before he left there were, were really interesting. You know, when he needed somebody to, you know, put together uh, a, a public report, uh, you know, he would go after people with journalism skills, you know, so he would hire journalists. When he needed somebody to, uh, you know, teach uh, security principles and things like that internally, he went out and found a teacher. You know, it, it, it's like, why, you know, when you think about these roles, you know, why would you take somebody with a cybersecurity background, you know, and, and try and stuff them into this? And similarly, I remember talking to Ryan Hoover when he was at uh, uh, Slack, and he would say it was easier for him to hire a software engineer and teach them security uh, principles and things like that than the other way around, than to take a security pe person and try and have them understand SRE and, and QA and you know, all those principles you need to uh, to build good processes, you know, and uh, again, when I look at postmortems, uh, you know, companies who who have failures, uh, a lot of it's process. It's like we built this thing, but nobody thought to test it first. You know, those kinds of things where, you know, uh, software engineers, you know, that that's like one on one debugging your stuff, making sure it works, you know, throwing uh, some test cases at it and things like that. And uh and yeah, if you're getting all your talent, if if all your folks are just coming straight out of school studying cyber and coming into it, that like they they don't teach you any of that. You know, there's nothing in the CISSP about uh, you know software resilience and and uh, reliability. No, and I I was at a conference this week in Atlanta, and I met a a young woman who is studying cybersecurity, and she's she's not 18. So I'm like, so what did you do before this? She's like, oh, I was doing HR and recruiting for the last 10 years. I yeah. said, okay, well, what, what do you like, what do you think, what's your plan? She's like, oh, I'm going to go get, you know, a help desk or a networking um, uh, internship. I said, why? I mean, why are you going to go down the engineering route? You can if you want to, but if your skill set is in understanding people and understanding how to hire people and what to look for and the, the you know, the nuances yeah. and a background check and all that, why don't you go into insider threat? You know, that's that space is a huge opportunity and you already have half the skills couple that with cyber. You can be trained into that. So I think it's also teaching people or, you know, rewiring how people are thought of how they can enter the, the industry. That is not just yeah. you know, your help desk. You do a little engineering, then you move here. There's other vectors that you yeah. can open up. And there's a lot of gatekeeping we had to get past, you know, because there used to be such a standard way up, you know, people would come like the sysadmin route or something like that. Yeah, they would learn how to hack, you know, uh, a lot of people uh, did pen testing at some point in their career, you know, and there's this kind of like, uh, you know, you get to pass those, those gates, you know, you got to know how to reverse malware or something like that before you can manage people. Like <laughs> that doesn't make any sense. <laughs> It, um, yes, I feel, I feel imposter syndrome very often because I can't do those things. Um, but you know, I can talk to your board and we'll get the point across and I'll get you your funding. Yeah. So, you know, there's two sides to it. Go ahead, Katie. How do we, how do we get past the bias from the other side, from the hiring side? Because it seems like, and I've been in security for a long time. I did not come with a technical background. I still don't have very technical skills, but there's there's definitely a place for me. I'm gainfully employed and I like my job and, and they seem to like me, knock on wood. But I definitely feel biased from a lot of people in the industry because I'm not technical, because I've never been technical. And I've gotten used to it, but I could see where somebody who's coming into the field wouldn't be comfortable enough because of all of that. And also from the hiring side, how do we start? Because we've been talking about this for a long time. There are a lot of jobs for non-technical people, but we still have AI or ML or, you know, character recognition, scanning resumes and not getting past the first round of, you know, recruitment, uh, searches. So how, how do we start to move past this? Getting filtered out by HR? Well, getting filtered out by HR, but even when you're in front of a hiring manager, who's one of those old school thinkers, that's like, well, you, you know, you don't have any technical background. So therefore mm -hmm. you can't, you won't ever, I've had people actually unfriend me in security because they thought I needed to learn more technical security to be good at my job. 
And like literally my whole job is translating the technical to the simple. And I've done this for a really long time. So it doesn't matter. And for a lot of people, it won't matter, but there's that bias. I'm just going to go ahead and say that you are you benefited the most from them unfriending you there. That's probably, <laughs> probably for the best. You don't need those people in your life. I don't. But how do we get around it? Because we do need more people in security. We do need more people who are thinking differently, creatively, you know, on echo chamber E. How, how do we yeah. get past this? I think it's by telling stories like um, the, the ones you just told of, of successful executives yeah. who looked outside of your standard hiring practices. You're hiring a teacher. And so my first job out of college was... Mm, Mm -mm. horrible, but taught me some good fundamentals, right? As most, most jobs out of school do. Um, so then when I got my like cushy corporate job, I was so grateful. And it's, it, and like, I, I worked my ass off, right? I was, I was number one employee because I was so grateful that you just, you want me to sit in front of a computer, maybe make some calls, talk to people. I got it. No problem. Versus the manual labor I was doing. So I, I think, you know, not only do you have to look at the skill sets that you're hiring for and somebody has to take a chance and, and prove those stories, you know, like, like Adrian just talked about. Um, but, but also know that the people you're going to be hiring and taking them out of, you know, maybe a serving job, nothing wrong with that, but maybe they want a little more stability and, and you know, set hours. They're going to be so grateful. They're going to work harder. They're going to, they're going to, um, go above and beyond because they, they are grateful and they are going to want to really prove themselves. That's just been my experience personally, as well as, you know, a handful of people that I can point to with similar stories. Um, so, you know, we have to take a chance, but it, but I think that starts from the top and directing down to, um, the hiring managers. Yeah. Yeah. Not just internally. I think in the industry, people need to see those success stories too, because, it's not just within the organization that, you know, people are getting scared off and run off and, you know, have running into these, uh, you know, the, this gatekeeping stuff, you know, if they attempt to participate in the, in the community or go to conferences and things like that, you know, you, you still encounter that uh, all over the place. And just earlier today, I was working on a project where we're, we're trying to make a list of all the absolute must haves in building a security program. And one of the things we were talking about is crisis communications. You know, I was saying crisis communications is possibly the most important part of a breach it is, is kind of handling how it's seen from the outside, uh, you know, and it's such an important piece that, you know, 99% of your classic, like uh, hacker, you know, uh, very technical folks, like I wouldn't want them anywhere near that. And it, it's critically important for, for cybersecurity. Um, so it, it, yeah, there's so many examples like that where, uh, you know, the, the kind of traditional idea we have of, of a, you know, someone, someone with a cybersecurity career, uh, you know, just, just doesn't fit it at all. And, and let's also think about what energizes people. So I can, you know, we have a tool, Code42 has a tool. I've done a lot of deployments, configurations, the whole, you know, working heavily with engineering and, and deployment. That does not bring me joy. I can do it, but it's not something that's going to energize me, right? Whereas maybe another, you know, somebody from our professional services team loves doing that. That's that's what gets them excited and they 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 feel alive and like they're really contributing. Why are you going to jam somebody into something that brings them down, that doesn't keep them engaged when you can find the right fit for in, in another type of role? So I think, you know, yes, yes, your um, crisis management or your, your engineers, security engineers can probably write some sort of brief, right? They can explain it, but that's not going to energize them. That's going to really drag them. It's going to take longer. It's not going to be quite the eloquent messaging that you need to get across when you have somebody who, you know, is more comfortable with it and, and understands those nuances. So I think, you know, as managers and in leadership in any role, you have to think about what, what type of requests are you giving to your team that are going to bring them up and make them excited? And what are the ones that really, you know, draw, drain them? 
Yeah, and I, I, an interesting stat we have here, and, and this was something I, I used to track back in the early days, um, you know, with, with some of the talks I did, I, I got very interested in security culture and people's backgrounds and things like that. And uh, learned about, uh, like, one of the things I asked about were, were hobbies. You know, it was fascinating seeing all, all the hobbies. You know, a lot, a lot of security people are, I think, uh, neurodiverse. And, and uh, a lot of us, you know, ADHD folks particularly, like to collect hobbies. You know, so it was really interesting seeing that everything that people got into. But, yeah, one of the things I, I found back then, uh, I think 2013 through 2015, you know, by my own stats, just looking in different places where I could actually track it, uh, we we're about eight eight percent, uh, you know, ninety two percent male versus female. And it's interesting because uh, you know almost every way I see it measured today, it's like one out of four. Uh, you know, it's it's twenty five percent. So it, I mean, I've never heard of another industry where it can change that fast. Of course, we're we're new. You know, you don't need a professional degree to be in cybersecurity. You know, I think that helps, you know, you can get into the industry uh, pre pretty quickly. But, um, you know, curious to, to both of your thoughts on, on like how we got there so quickly. And, you know, but I still hear these stories of people who are in cybersecurity for three, four years and they're like, yeah, no, I'm out. So, you know, clearly we haven't fixed all the problems uh, by any stretch. But, uh, but yeah, to see it jump up that much, I, I thought was really interesting. And I kind of wonder, like, like it, are those people switching careers coming over? Are those uh, new people coming in? You know, a mix of all of the above. I don't, I don't know if either of you have any, any additional insight there. I do, actually, because I just wrote a piece with Lynn Dome, who's in uh, the executive director of WESIS, uh, Women in Cybersecurity. And now WESIS um, co uh, commissioned a report and they do a lot of research, obviously, about women in security, but not just women. They also do research into underrepresented groups. Um, I've been writing about women in security and looking into it for a really long time. And when I started doing that back in 2011, 2012-ish, yeah, the numbers were lower. I think part of the reason there has been an increase in the number of women, I mean, it's slight. We're not, you know, hockey stick growth or anything, but there's been a really good concerted effort, not just by women in security, helping, mentoring, promoting women, but also we do have allies in the community. Adrian, you know, you've been an ally to me for many, many years. And I have, I have a lot of great male friends in security who have helped me along, who have quite literally dragged me along at conferences and introduced me to new people. And, and I think it takes a certain kind of person, a secure person, a, an empathetic person who will do that kind of thing. But at least in my experience, I know that people are thinking about it in security. So I think that's helped. There have been a lot of mentorship programs. Um, I know, you know, the program that was started with the Girl Scouts is amazing. But yet the research that Lynn, um, Wiesis, and, and their partner have done have shown that women hit a glass ceiling at about year six. And then they start opting out of security entirely because they aren't growing. They aren't being given the opportunities. They aren't feeling included. And so while we're doing pretty well, at least according to the research and the data that, that people have been looking into for years, there's still that, that limit um, where we're seeing a lot of women and uh, underrepresented groups say, I, I don't want to do this anymore. There's no more growth for me. I don't, you know, I'm female, I'm non-binary, I'm non-white. Um, so it's still there. So we still have work to do, but I do think you know, and obviously, Clea, you can you can weigh in your thoughts too, being a female in security. But I do think that women who are in security are pretty passionate about getting other people there, and that's helped convey that message to others who aren't women. And, and you know, again, same thing with underrepresented groups. I think the passion for bringing people in has been one of the key contributors to you know, going from about 11% to about a quarter percent of women in security, at least. 
Yeah, I agree with everything, Katie. And I've had very similar experiences to you where it's just been like, I've had a few male mentors and they have, you know, A, given me a chance, a break in into the industry, um, seeing not, you know, the, the hard skills, but the soft skills, the intangible things that you can learn, right? You can learn the rest. Um, and given me a chance and, you know, yes, I want to do the same thing for other people, you know? Um, I, I think also with more women in security, we are seeing a shift in the culture, which again, opens it up a little bit more. It's less about, we are doing this behind closed doors because guess what? This is not just protecting the perimeter. We all are, uh, or are individuals who are bringing vulnerabilities to our organizations and to ourselves between all the tools that we're using and our mobile phones, right? Like we are walking targets. And if you pretend like you can just put it all behind a wall and that's going to work, it's not going to work. So I think with more females in the, in the industry, we are starting to communicate outward the why behind things. Again, it's a sort of softer approach, bringing people into the fold, be part of the solution, training with education versus blocking, um, you know, the, 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 what have I heard? The office of no, right? Security is the office of no. Everything is a no, no, no. No. Now we're now we're shifting, rewiring how we're communicating and saying, well, let's, you know, let's think about that. Why why do you need to do that? Okay, how can I help you achieve that goal? Okay, you need this application. Fine, let's get you the enterprise version where I have visibility to it versus, you know, this fr freebium one that I have no idea what you're doing and it probably doesn't have security around it. You know, like it, it's just a different way to approach these, the same problems, but instead you're bringing people into it. And I think that's more of a female characteristic. I don't, you know, don't want to yeah. completely write off the male population, but you know, it, we, we do approach things differently. So my two cents on that. One thing that helped me a lot when I was starting in a content role uh, back in 2011, and, and everybody has their own version of this that they can apply, but I had a little security knowledge. I was in sales before it. I was selling to security companies, so I understood what security was. I didn't have technical details, but I just threw myself into a role that had become open and started a program at a company that was all about published research where there hadn't been any before. And the thing about security practitioners that I found the really technical people is that they're really often quite comfortable talking about the technical details. They can execute the technical details, but when they were asked to actually write about them, they were a little shell-shocked, quite honestly. And I said to a number of the people I worked with, I had a group of maybe 15 or 20 subject matter experts that I worked with regularly. And I said to them, I need you to write this paper and I need your name to be on it. If you can't write it, send me a list of bullet points. I will write it for you. We'll clean it up. We'll put your name on it. It'll look great. And I literally had at least six people who regularly just sent me like 50 bullets because they knew writing, not my forte. I want my name to be associated with this topic. I know what I'm doing technically. I can't make it eloquent on paper. So I just said, I'm going to partner with you. You're still going to get all the glory. I don't really care if my name is on it. I want this program to work. And so it was this amazing symbiotic relationship because I could make them look good in a published form. And they were, unbeknownst to them, I think, giving me an education in technical right. details. And so it was this amazing marriage of skills. We both got a lot out of it. It made the program great. It led to my next job and the next job and the next job. So I think everybody can find that if you're, if you feel like your skills are upper, underrepresented, if you feel like your gender, your sexual orientation, your race, your religion, your whatever, find somebody who wants to balance off of you yeah. and work together. It, it, it really, it was definitely the one thing that put me in a place where I could stand on my own two feet. And these technical people didn't even realize they were helping me that much. And you were helping them because I bet writing the documentation was again, something that it was a drag and like, you know, the last thing that they would want to do. And you helped that. Yeah. I love that story. 
And yeah, everybody's yeah, got something that they can contribute in that way. Everyone. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, we, we need literally everything in security. Security is such a broad uh, thing, you know, anywhere technology touches or, or people and technology come together, uh, you know, there, there's some skill we need, you know, uh, graphic design is, is huge. UI UX is super, super important. Uh, we know for, for people to uh, be able to use, for, for them to even be willing to use security solutions, right? You know, like the, the more invisible it is, the more, uh, the easier it is to use, you know, may, maybe it's gamification, you know, something like that. You know, there's there's all these different skills uh, we can bring in from creative types uh, that that are going to hugely help uh, security because if if the user doesn't want to do it, if people uh, you know choose not to use it, you know, on the consumer side, for example, you know, and you can only force enterprise folks to use something so much, uh, you know, it's really got to be you know, we need creative types to make it palatable, to make it uh, uh, you know something that that you know people would would actually want to use. For example, yeah. and it's just one example, right? Right? How design comes into it. I think people expect that now. I mean, yeah, they expect the tools that they're interacting with to be easy, intuitive, yeah, and and beautiful, right? This I, isn't an like, iPhone app. I'm not going to get out of here. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Wait, you, if this doesn't have you know easy to use. I have to read instructions. Forget it. I'm out of here. That's how There's a whole now. science to design. Yeah. There's a whole science to it that designers understand that they've learned. I, I had somebody recently say to me, well, why don't you just create your own presentation for that talk? And I was like, because we have designers who do this better. I'll create the content. I'm good at content. Let somebody who's really good at design do the design. Let them do it. Yeah. They know it's, it's great. Again, symbiosis. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I want to shift a little bit here before we have to wrap up the conversation. Talk a little bit about this annual report uh, that you guys have. This, uh, um, yeah, remind me on the title of the report. I have the acronym here, DER. Oh gosh, data. I'm gonna just look it up because find it. <laughs> data exposure to... report. Yes. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. I've only been doing it, you know, for five years. And I love, um, yeah, it's just because I put you on the spot. And, and I love that the acronym is DER because the, my first thought when I looked at it is like, okay, everything in this report is going to be duh, you know? Well, the, the report started because we were, Code 42 was entering into a data, the data protection space specifically around insiders. And we wanted to understand like, what is the state of data protection today? And so to get that, you know, we interviewed hundreds of security practitioners to just understand, you know, what are your challenges? Where are you? Where are you finding success? Where are you just trying to ignore the problem? And that has expanded over the years to the problem is growing. We are seeing a growth of incidents from insiders. You know, one in four incidents are related to an insider and one of three of those are related to a data loss event. And most of them are you know, I mean, you you could say it's half of them are malicious and half of them are just negligent users, but it exposes the organization. So, you know, we we wanted to just get insight into that space um, and then understand the cost of it. Not only the cost of the data that's leaving, but the cost of um, remediation and running a program and, you know, what's so challenging. And a lot of it is, I mean, we know this. We now have bought every single tool under the sun and we still are not able to to find the solution. So why is that? You know, and like like let's keep digging out. So it's it's interesting. The stories. Um, I think we have now more now people have more visibility, but not necessarily the ability to affect change yet. Right. right. It's almost a curse, right? You know, almost every tool I see come out is like, oh, we give you more visibility. You know, and, and it's it's like already the the company they're trying to sell to all you see is a hand you know coming out of the you know just <laughs> drowning in all their visibility oh okay, you know and it, it reminds me of this uh i forget the name of the comedian but it reminds me of this quote where somebody asked the guy what's it like having a fourth child and he said imagine you're in the middle of the ocean and you're drowning and then somebody hands you a baby and, and and that's yeah. what it sounds like, like adding like yet another visibility system on top of this. 
okay, like, like, and, and how are we going to use this? How do we put this information to work? You know, it's, it's just too much. Um, but yeah, it's, it's, and AI is, is yet another one where, you know, I've been having a lot of chats about Copilot and people want to know, okay, what, what are people putting in the props? How are they using it? You know, I want some visibility of uh, how this stuff is going to, going to be used. And so there's some great stats in this report about, uh, unsurprising to me, because I've been having so many of these conversations with companies who are, uh, have generative AI, uh, mostly Microsoft Copilot, uh, you know, in a pilot right now, and, and they haven't fully adopted it yet. But yeah, 80%, 87%, this report, your report says, are wary Gen I could expose sensitive data to competitors. And this is something I've been saying on every call is we absolutely will see a moment where somebody realizes the support bot on a website or something like that is connected to an LLM and they're going to start asking it for stuff that it's not supposed to be giving out just to see what's there, just to see what it has access to and, and what it'll hand out. Yeah. Um, well, funny story in that I was, I was using chat GPT and I was putting stuff in about code 42 because I was asking it questions like, you know, how would you deploy it just to see, you know, what the response is. And it's giving me stuff that I wrote, which was crazy. Yeah. Like, where did you find that? You know, it's like, that's pretty cool. So it's great. It's scraping, right? So people are going to put something in. And for the record, what I was putting in was very generic, nothing proprietary, nothing sensitive. I was just asking questions like, how do you, how do you deploy this? How does it compare against X, Y, and Z? And it, it was giving me information that I think was public, but you don't know. Yeah, right. You know, and it's now that it's uh, these things are going to have a mix of access to both public information and private information. Uh, you know, data is tough. Data is tough to secure. Like, it's just a mess. It's all over the place. And it's uh, I think it's going to be highlighted uh, by a lot of these tools. The, the fact that uh, we, we thought we had the data pretty well cleaned up and organized, but apparently not. Yeah. I, and I think it, you know, depends on the risk tolerance. And of course, that is usually defined by where are you going to get fined, you know, if, if there is a breach. Because at this point, the general public, if there's a data breach, doesn't really affect who they're doing business with. Yeah. I mean, you're, you're, still, you're still using Microsoft. You're still, you know, putting information into uh, 23andMe, although I would not, but some people are, you know. It doesn't, it doesn't really affect the humans. It affects, uh, you know, who's going to be sued. Well, we, we've run out of time, but uh, I would really urge people to check out the report. A lot of interesting stuff in there. Get into how DLP alone isn't going to be enough anymore. You know, already, like I was talking about Copilot, like, you know, they, they've got the, you know, they try and push their DLP, but there's so much it has access to that aren't files and the sensitive uh, data tagging feature you know, that they have with, with uh, I think it's Priva or one of those, I forget the names of all the products, uh, all the new names, but uh, yeah, it doesn't work on email and calendar and chat and all that stuff. Uh, so yeah, it's, it's uh, I think a very timely report too. Like I was reading this thing and, and you know, thinking that these are exactly the conversations I'm having right now. So good stuff. We do have a link to that in the show notes uh, uh, for this uh, segment. And uh, Clea, thank you so much for joining us on Enterprise Security Weekly today. This is a really fun conversation. Really fun. Thank you all so much. Bye. All right. Stick around. We'll be right back in a few moments with both Tyler Shields and the weekly Enterprise News. <laughs> 